We come now to our fifth and final sola, and hopefully after this session and a brief break, you'll be able to come and stay with us for one more session as we have an opportunity to talk as speakers and answer some of your questions and hopefully have a fitting end to this conference. I'm very grateful that Derek Thomas can be with us. I'm always grateful when I get a chance to be with Derek and to sit under his teaching, in particular for him uh, coming rather last minute. I think it was maybe just a week ago that I texted and said, um, I have a favor to ask. And so he has uh, just left his church where they were getting ready for uh, their festivities tomorrow to drive up through traffic and come be with us. And then when we're done here, he'll drive right back down to Columbia. Derek is the senior minister at the First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. I've had the, the privilege of being there on a number of occasions. It's a wonderful, wonderful church. It's always 110 degrees when I've been there, but it's a wonderful church with a, a rich legacy. Uh, in addition, Derek teaches systematic theology at uh, various campuses throughout the RTS system. So as Mike said, there are a number of systematics professors here and I get to hang out with them as the uneducated one among all of them. So it's great to have such smart friends. And uh, that's, that's the main thing I want you to know about Derek. He is a godly pastor and a good friend. And there are so many occasions when I've texted him and said, can you talk for a few minutes? Could you help us out here? And he's always been more than willing and eager to do so. And now I look forward, as you do, to hearing from him as he leads us in thinking on this great topic of God's glory. Derek, thank you for being with us. Let's welcome him. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I'm uh, jealous for you uh, that you've managed to reel him in from the cold dark north, and not quite to South Carolina, but almost. <laughs> and it's a great joy, it's a great privilege uh, for me personally to know that Kevin is uh, just, well, it's an hour plus Charlotte traffic away. Well, turn with me, if you would, and it's an honor to uh, come and speak to you this afternoon. I unfortunately was not here for uh, the earlier sessions, and I, I hate that, and therefore I'm completely oblivious if I'm stepping on something that somebody else has said. I, I beg your pardon for that. Um, the text, that, or at least the topic that was given to me, uh, was uh, Soli Deo Gloria, the fifth of the five solars, and, and I immediately thought of the closing verses of Romans chapter 11. So turn to Romans chapter 11 and verse uh, 33, and we'll be reading through to the end of the chapter at verse 36. Romans 11 and verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments, and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. As we celebrate uh, this weekend and, and perhaps in the coming days of next week, and particularly on the 31st, uh, which is a Tuesday, and I have two or three other events next week all commemorating uh, the 500th anniversary uh, of the Reformation and uh, the nailing of the 95 statements, theses, protests to the castle church door at Wittenberg, and I see that Eric Metaxas's new biography of Luther questions whether Luther actually did that. Um, 
He might have sent somebody else to do it, and that would have been fine. Uh, but whether he actually physically did it with his own hands and, and nailed those, those statements to the door as talking points for the Reformation, and if you've never read the 95 Theses, um, you probably need to do so in the next 48 hours because you probably will not do it ever again uh, until the 600th anniversary, and I for sure will not be around uh, at the 600th anniversary. Uh, and they may surprise you, and you may already have spoken about this earlier, uh, just um, how, how set they are in the context of events that were taking place in 1517, and particularly uh, Johann Tetzel and, and the selling of indulgences and so on. And uh, um, Luther is still perhaps on a trajectory towards understanding the gospel, and it may it may be another year or two. Certainly by 1520, I think he has uh, been through the so-called tower experience and, and has understood especially that formative text in Romans in chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17, that, that the gospel therein is the gospel revealed uh, in the display of the righteousness of God. And for uh, the monk, Luther, uh, lecturing, uh, graduated as, with his doctorate and, and teaching uh, biblical theology at the newly established um, university at Wittenberg. Uh, he, he did, as all professors in their first year or two hope they can do, uh, that is, teach something that they already know uh, rather than teach something that they don't know. And what Luther knew, or at least knew uh, in large measure, and perhaps knew off by heart uh, were the Psalms, uh, because as a medieval monk, uh, he would have sang and chanted the Psalms, all 150 Psalms, every week. That's quite a staggering thing, uh, that in the seven periods of worship each day uh, over the course of a week, he would have chanted um, the 150 Psalms, and by this time he had done this for a decade or more, and, and probably uh, it's not an exaggeration to think that he knew the book of Psalms, at least in the Latin Vulgate uh, edition of those Psalms. He knew them off by heart. And, and one of the things that came to him as he was lecturing on uh, the Psalms was the frequency with which the psalmist mentions the righteousness of God, but often mentions it in a context and in a way that suggests that the righteousness of God was something of a blessing to us. Vindicate me in your righteousness, the psalmist says, for example, in Psalm, I think, 77. Vindicate me in your righteousness. And for the Augustinian monk, righteousness was something that terrified him, and the righteousness of God was something that terrified him. So, how could God vindicate Martin Luther in his righteousness? It was more likely that in his righteousness he would cast Martin Luther out of his sight and into the flames of purgatory and hell beyond that. And it was turning to the first chapter of this epistle of Romans in the first chapter that eventually would bring for Martin Luther the dawn of the gospel, that the righteousness that God requires in His holiness and in His integrity, the righteousness that God requires is, and His words originally were, a passive righteousness, a righteousness that God actually provides through the language that Martin Luther came to employ the language of the great exchange, that as our sins are reckoned to Christ, the righteousness and obedience of Christ is reckoned to our account, and therein is the gospel revealed, that the, God, that the righteousness that God requires is a righteousness that He provides in union and in communion with Jesus Christ. And here in Paul's letter to the Romans, Luther would go on to teach, after teaching on the Psalms, he went on to teach on the book of Hebrews and uh, the epistle of Paul to the Galatians, which he would return to 
uh, some 15 years later, uh, and, and also to lecture through this magisterial letter of uh, Paul to the Romans, in which Paul expounds the gospel, the gospel that was discovered and rediscovered at the time of the Reformation. There's a piece of correspondence uh, in the letters of John Calvin in which, uh, almost as a side note, because he's discussing something else, he, he says we ought to give thanks to Luther. Now, remember that Luther spoke German and, and uh, Calvin spoke French, and, and Luther did not speak French, and Calvin did not speak German, and therefore there was no correspondence between uh, Luther and Calvin. Moreover, Luther was almost a father figure to Calvin, and it's one of those surprising things, the almost complete absence of correspondence between uh, Luther and Calvin. Calvin never left Switzerland. Once he'd left France, he never left uh, Switzerland. And, and uh, Luther, uh, for events uh, that, that are too difficult now to go into, uh, hardly ever left Germany because there was a price on his head. And uh, in a piece of correspondence at a much later time, uh, Calvin says we ought to give thanks to Luther because he gave us back the gospel. And that's his language. He gave us back the gospel. So, as we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, that is its essence. Its essence is the gospel. Why do we celebrate this? Because it's all about the gospel. It's about our understanding of the gospel, and it's about our ongoing understanding of the gospel and how we need to preach that gospel to ourselves every single day, every morning when we arise. And Paul expounds on it here in his epistle to the Romans. He spends the first three, three and a half uh, chapters, especially chapters two and three, uh, and, and into halfway through chapter three, expounding the doctrine of sin and therefore the necessity of grace, that whether Jew or Gentile, there is none righteous, no not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're going to talk in a minute about soli deo gloria, the glory of God, to God be the glory alone. And the essence of sin, Paul says, and it's fascinating that that's how he describes sin in his epistle to the Romans. When you go to the epistle of John, for example, sin is the transgression of the law, and that has become the standard definition and understanding of sin in, say, the Shorter Catechism, that sin is the transgression of the law. Um, but there's another aspect to sin. Not only is it a transgression of law, but it is also falling short of God's glory, the glory that God intended for us as image bearers that one of the things that sin has done is rob us of that glory for that for which we were made, so that there is a God-shaped void within our hearts, that there's always a sense in which in the natural man, despite what he says, he has more knowledge of God than he ever will confess, but there's always that sense that we are falling short of that for which we were made. It was something Augustine uh, expressed so vividly uh, in his uh, confessions that we were made uh, for God and for glorifying God. Thou hast made us for Thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in Thee. And that's what sin does in the heart and lives of the natural man. It causes us to fall short of the glory of God. And, and then halfway through the third chapter, Paul segues into the marvelous and astonishing truth of justification, justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone and apart from the works of the law, stressing the grace of God in our salvation, that justification is a declarative statement of this great and awesome God, that He treats us not as we are, but as we are in union with 
Jesus Christ received by faith alone, so that in Christ, as the examples of Abraham and David, those are the two examples. Where does Paul get his doctrine of justification by faith from? And he gets it from the Old Testament. He gets it from the narrative of two of the great men of the Old Testament, Abraham and, and David that this is not simply a doctrine of the new covenant. It's not simply that they were saved by works in the Old Testament and by faith in Christ in the New Testament. Paul's own doctrine of justification is rooted in the redemptive history of the Old Testament. Abraham was saved by faith in Christ and apart from the works of the law. David was saved by faith in Christ and apart from the works of the law. And then, perhaps, in the fifth chapter, as he expounds on union with Adam and, and union with Christ, these, these two and every single human being is in union with one or the other, and our future destinies beyond this life, a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned, is based entirely upon whether we are in union with Adam or whether we are in union with Christ. And from it, from union with Jesus Christ, comes that blessed assurance which is at the heart of the Reformation. It was Cardinal Bellamine, uh, the leader of the Counter-Reformation and, and le leader of the Roman Catholic um, uh, force against the Reformation, who said that the greatest error of Protestantism was not not justification by faith, as you might expect him to have said, but that the greatest error of the Reformation was assurance. Because if you are assured, you don't need priests, and you don't need confessionals, and you don't need the ritual and ceremony of the Roman Catholic Church and its treadmill of sacramentalism. It was such a liberating thing that we are all priests in Jesus Christ and receive the absolute assurance that in Him, by faith in Him, we are reckoned to be law keepers and covenant keepers. And it was a doctrine that the Roman Catholic Church and Cardinal Bellamine uh, in particular said would lead to antinomianism. And indeed, that is at least initially the conclusion, because Paul in the first chapter, first verse of chapter 6, actually asks that question, shall we sin that grace may abound? If you've never asked that question, if you've never asked that question, you haven't understood justification. If you're not tempted to antinomianism, if you're not tempted to say, well, then it doesn't matter what I do, because my past sins and present sins and future sins are all forgiven. If you're not tempted to ask that question, you haven't understood justification. And so Paul begins to answer that question, and his answer is immediate and in at least the King James Version, the answer is, God forbid, meganoito. This cannot be, because we don't just get forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, we get Jesus Himself. And how can I sin when I'm in fellowship with Jesus? How can I look Jesus in the face and continue to sin? How can I hold his hand and watch pornography? It cannot be done. And so Paul expounds on the doctrine of sanctification and the consequence of justification and union with Jesus Christ, reaching that peroration at the close of the eighth chapter that nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Not life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation, because we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And then he segues into chapters 9 and 10 and 11 and talks about Israel and talks about the church and, and, and reaches then this, this astonishing conclusion after beginning with the doctrine of election because 
How can this gospel be true? How can I be a child of God? What is the reason this afternoon that I am reckoned to be righteous in Jesus Christ, and that I am promised an eternal future with Him? And the answer is that we're not just Johnny-come-latelys. This is not some whim that God has embarked upon. It has been God's choice. It has been God's mind. It has been what He has been about from the very beginning, from before creation. And He launches, therefore, into an explanation of the predestinating work of God and the sovereign electing purposes of God and the doctrine of preterition, difficult as that is. Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, and so on, and comes then to this, this extraordinary conclusion, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Well, that's a long introduction, and if I was preaching a sermon at RTS Charlotte, I'd fail, uh, because now I've, I've, I've committed the unpardonable sin that I'm now racing against the clock, but I want us to see three things here as we try to think about solideo gloria. We've thought over these last 24, 26 hours about faith alone, uh, sola fide, without our being obliged to work for it, uh, sola gratia, God's free favor alone, without our having to earn or deserve it first. We've thought about solus Christus, Christ the God-man only, without any other mediatorial agent, whether that agent be priest or, or, or saint or virgin, by Scripture alone, sola scriptura, without regard to such unbiblical and unfounded extras as the doctrines of uh, purgatory and of pilgrimages and relics and papal indulgences and, and devices for shortening one's stay in purgatory, and praise, praise for salvation to God alone, Sali Deo Gloria. And what we have, first of all, is a vision of the incomprehensibility of God. Oh, the depth, both of the riches and knowledge of God. His ways are past finding out. It's um, quite extraordinary, isn't it, that Paul is the one who's saying this, because Paul had a great mind. If you could measure the intelligence of these four guys sitting down here, it would be off the scale. And each one knows stuff about particular things that are definitely off the scale, and uh, one is in awe of them, and I am in awe of them. But they are absolutely nothing in comparison to the Apostle Paul. Paul had one of the greatest minds of the first century. He had a phenomenal education under Gamaliel. He had, he had, studied, he had studied philosophy. He had studied Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and others, and he, he, could, he could have taken on any of them, the best of them. He could have stood in, in uh, the marketplace in any city in the Roman Empire and argued his case. He had a phenomenal mind. Peter, the Apostle Peter, says something, and it always brings me great comfort. He says, there are some things in Paul that are hard to be understood. I, I find that amazingly refreshing to think that even one of the apostles whom the Holy Spirit implies as an organ in the giving of Scripture itself finds some things in Paul are difficult to understand. I have absolutely no idea what Paul is talking about, about women's head covering. I've, I've studied, I've read, I've read lots of stuff about it, and I'm still puzzled exactly what it is that he is saying. I, I'm currently preaching on Galatians, and I, I, I foolishly thought when I began that this was a relatively simple epistle to understand. It's one of his earliest epistles. And, and then in chapter 3, he just goes AWOL and, <laughs> and 
there's a logic in his argument about God being one and, and, and the law being given through a mediator and so on that absolutely floors me. I have no idea of the logic of it. And I have to tell you, when I preached a sermon on it recently, I just skipped over it because I thought, if I even begin to go down here, I'm never going to come out again. I'm going to be lost in a labyrinth that, that I, I, I'd need to tie a piece of rope in order to get back to the logic of Paul's argument. So I thought, I'm, I'm not even going to touch it and hope nobody notices, but of course everybody noticed. And I was quizzed about it on the way out. Well, Paul is saying here, as he contemplates the being of God and the mind of God and the knowledge of God, it is, it is past finding out. There is no bottom to it. Augustine, when he was in his discussions about the Trinity, and uh, he, he makes this comment that the doctrine of the Trinity is shallow enough for children to paddle in and deep enough for elephants to swim in. And then he goes on to say, I see the depths, he said, but I cannot, I cannot see the bottom. I, I see the depths. My, my mind hurts, but I can't see the bottom of it. I'm often amazed. It's, uh, it's something that comes with age, I suppose. I, I'm often amazed by the epistemological arrogance of those who are at seminary and they're in their twenties and they've read a few books and, and all of a sudden they seem to know everything. And uh, frequently I'll have people come and say things like, um, you know, I like to think that and I, I don't let that sentence end. Because in one sense, what you think is of relatively little importance at this stage because you're here to learn. And that's, I know that's terribly old-fashioned and there's a, there's a president here of the seminary, and, and I'll repent immediately afterwards. <laughs> but I, I do find that epistemologically arrogant, that you need to sit at the feet of some of the great minds, like Augustine, like, like, like Calvin, like Edwards. It's something that the Old Testament prophets were sensitive to, and Paul quotes here from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, 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 to whom then shall you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One, who has known, and this is the quotation here in verse 34, who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? We do it all the time, of course, in pastoral situations when we find ourselves in providential circumstances that are difficult to understand, and we sometimes think that God has got it wrong. Maybe He lacks some information. Maybe the logic of His argument is faulty, and we try to quiz Him and try to put Him right on a certain matter, because what has happened can't possibly be God's providence for us. And the prophets of the seventh and eighth centuries, as they were contemplating vast vast changes in the layout of world history in the coming of the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and, and they're saying, who has known the mind of the Lord? When Calvin preached a series of sermons on Job in 1554 and 1555, these were midweek sermons, and he preached them over a period of about 14 months or so, beginning with the first verse of chapter 1 and ending in the final verse of chapter 42, some 14 months uh, later, 159 sermons later, but in the very first one, in February of 1554, he begins by saying, it is a great thing to be subject to the sovereignty of God. It is a great thing to be subject to the majesty of God. Oh, the depth, both of the riches and knowledge of God, His ways are past finding out the knowledge of God. God knows everything. 
He's omniscient. Nothing is a mystery to him. He's not a mystery to himself. You know, we are mysteries to ourselves. We think we know ourselves, and then all of a sudden we, we, have, we say, well, why did I do that? I mean, what possibly possessed me to do that or say that? I cannot understand myself. But God is not a mystery to Himself. He knows everything outside of Himself and inside Himself. He knows the past and the present and the future, and, and there are no surprises. There is no openness as far as His knowledge of the future. It, there, is no, there is no risk for God in the future. There is no stray molecule. There is no black hole. The wisdom of God, using knowledge for good purposes, using knowledge for good ends, and you see it in the unfolding of the gospel. The wisdom, Christ is the wisdom of God. God fulfilling His design and purposes to save a people for Himself in His judgments, in His decrees, what He has determined and caused. What Paul is talking about when he says in Ephesians, the, his intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities and uh, in the heavenly places according to His eternal purpose, which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's plan. Oh, the depth of it. God is incomprehensible to us. It's not that He cannot be known. He can be known. He can be known. He reveals Himself in creation, and He reveals Himself in His Word, and He reveals Himself in Jesus Christ, and God can be known. That's the glory of the gospel this afternoon, that we can truly say, I know God. I know Him. I know Him personally. I know Jesus. He walks with me and He talks with me, and sentimental as that may be, that is true. But He remains incomprehensible. I cannot, I cannot see the bottom. I can see the depths. And every day I'm overwhelmed by the depths of it, but I cannot see the bottom. And then secondly, a vision of the sovereignty of God. And you notice he quotes in verse 35, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? As though God was obliged to us in some way. You know, I keep looking down because at First Presbyterian Church there's a step here. And if you take a step backwards, you are, you are going to do damage to yourself and others. Um, so, I'm, I'm a little nervous about… that's why I keep looking down, but I'm okay, I can step away. Um, this quotation in verse 35 is from the book of Job. It's actually from the conclusion of the book of Job. And what is the book of Job about? It's about a man who is godly perhaps the godliest man on the face of the earth, who finds himself in circumstances that make absolutely no sense to him. He has lost everything. He has lost his wealth. He has lost his health. He has lost all ten of his children. He's lost the respect of his friends because his friends only have one song, and they sing it to death. And their song is that Suffering is always God's retribution. It is punishment. Punishment for sin that you have done, and sin that you have done that you know about, or sin that you have done that you don't know about. Some big sin, or little sin, or a whole collection of sins, but somehow, some way, this terrible providence is the result of your sin, and you need to repent of it. You need to fess up and acknowledge it and repent of it, and, and, and then there might be a way back into fellowship and communion with God. And we know that that's not the right answer. Now, that may be a right answer in other circumstances, but it's not the right answer here, because God tells us so, and He tells us so three times in the prologue to Job. And so, Job has been asking for God to speak. And the three friends have spoken, and, and 
and Elihu has spoken, and Elihu has contributed something that the other three friends have not, but we need not go into that today. And then finally, in chapter 38 and verse 1, God finally speaks. It's been a long time coming. And listening to the silence of God has been as difficult as it has been to listen to the thunders of God that have brought about these terrible providences in Job's life. And when God finally appears in Job chapter 38 and verse 1, He comes in a whirlwind. You'd think He would come in a still small voice like He came to Elijah when He's sitting underneath the the juniper tree, and he's feeling sorry for himself, and God isn't in the thunder, and he's not in the fire and the storm, but he's in a still, small voice and whispering sweet nothings into his ear. But that's not how God comes to Job, and, and he says to Job, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? And the answer is Job. And he says to him, dress for action like a man, using a Hebrew verb that is derived from the realm of wrestling because Job has been asking for a fight. Uh, Not a fisticuffs fight, but an epistemological fight, a fight about ideas, a fight about truth and meaning and justice and what's right and wrong and morality and the existence of God and the unfairness of life and providence and a thousand other things. And then God tells him the rules of this exchange. I will ask you, and you will answer me, and you want to say, that's not fair, because Job is the one asking the questions, and God is the one who's supposed to answer them. And so, what is the first question? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? And you want to say, that's not fair. I'm not playing this game. And you take your stuff, and you move to the next room, and you slam the door, and you say, well, that's not fair. That's not right. And it's, it's not right. What kind of question is that? Do you know where you were when God laid the earth's foundation? And what's that got to do with Job's suffering and the loss of ten children and the loss of his health? And he's at death's door, his skin and bones. And there are sixty-five or so other questions, and none of which Job can answer. And then in the concluding chapters, he introduces two creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan, and, and the clock is saying, I can't go here. So, just for today, and I'm aware of all the opinions, I'm aware of the modern opinion that, that uh, Leviathan is, uh, is a sea mo- monster and may, be, and may be synonymous with Satan himself, who has appeared in the opening two chapters of Job, but doesn't appear at the end, and, and therefore maybe it's Leviathan. Let me, just, let me just cite an authority, uh, Kleins on Job, one of the world's leading authorities in the book of Job, three volumes in the Word Biblical Commentary, more reading than you have a lifetime to read. It's completely over the top. But his conclusion is that Behemoth and Levi- Leviathan are an elephant or a, or a hippopotamus and a crocodile. So let's just go with that. Just for today, it doesn't make any difference to the point that's being made. Why did God make a crocodile? Why did God make a crocodile? I I have given money to saving the polar bear. Uh, Not a lot. I think I gave ten dollars. I like polar bears, so I would be very sorry. And this is, this is not, nothing to do with Democrats. It's got nothing to do with global warming. I'm just making a point that if the polar bear were to cease, uh, become extinct, I'd be sad. I, like, I don't want to be very close to polar bears. I, I think they can turn on you, but from a distance, and if they're on an ice cap and there's water between us, I'm fine. I, I would love to see a polar bear. I went on an Alaskan cruise, you know, I'm at that time of life where I go on Alaskan cruises, and uh, I, I, was, I looked everywhere, everywhere, I had binoculars, I was looking for a polar bear, never saw one, I would love to see one. Why did God make a crocodile? I'm going to tell you something, and it might shock you, and I hope you're not terribly upset. I wouldn't shed a tear if there were no crocodiles left, <laughs> if there was some disease that wiped them all out. But I never saw a crocodile. There wasn't one left in the other. I wouldn't shed a 
Tia, why did God make crocodiles? And the only reason I can think of is shoes. <laughs> well, that's the question God puts to Job, you know. What a strange question. Why did God make behemoth and leviathan? A land creature, a sea creature, water creature. And I know the answer. I know the answer. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> that is the answer. I don't know. I, I have no idea what possessed the mind of God to make a crocodile, except this, for His own glory. For His own glory. And that's Paul's point here in quoting. Do you, do you think God is indebted to you? Who is given to God that he might repay you. Do you think he owes you something? Like he's got an I owe, I owe you. Look, I owe you a favor. I, I owe you an explanation. These terrible things that come into the lives of God's people. Terrible things. I, I had a text message on the way up. I can't relate it uh, to you, but, but, but if it's true, and I will find out uh, after this meeting, if it's true, it's terrible. It's awful. Something terrible has happened to a certain family. Something really bad has happened. And I know that when I go and visit later on this evening, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be asked this question, why? Why? Why me? Why now? Why in this way? Does God not love me? And we think He owes us an explanation. We're entitled to an explanation, and Job didn't get an explanation. He never got an explanation. And, and this is Paul's point. Paul is speaking about the plan and the purpose of God on a cosmic scale, but he doesn't owe you an explanation. Why does he elect some and pass by others? That's not just a theoretical question that we ask in a class in ST1 when we're dealing with the doctrine of God proper. It's a, class, it's a question we ask about our loved ones who die without faith in Christ, and, and for all we know, they've gone to hell. Why does God show His love to one and not another? Why are you a professing Christian this afternoon? Because in one sense, the Reformation says, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. No, in another sense, it does, of course. We're not automatons. You have to believe. You have to exercise faith. You have to repent of your sins. But you couldn't do that unless God, first of all, worked in you. So, who gets the glory? Because that's how He ends, for from Him and through Him and, and to Him. From Him in the past. Of Him, from Him. Everything has come into being by the decree of God, by the purposes of God. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful. The Lord God made them all. He brought you into being, created you in the womb of your mother. And through Him, in the present, He sustains. Everything has been through Him, through His sustaining power. He gives life and breath and everything else. In Him we live and move and have our being. And to Him in the future. To Him be the glory. What does the Reformation do? It makes us small in one sense, S small in ourselves, small in our estimation of ourselves, and then it makes us great. It liberates us. That's why, that's why Luther wrote 
one of his first books that he wrote was on the freedom of the Christian man, because, because the gospel liberates us. God alone is Lord of the conscience and hath left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men. That's one of the most liberating truths in all the universe, and the Reformation gave us that, so that we might live as God intended us to live, by the power of the Holy Spirit in union with Christ on a journey that's going to take us all the way home to a new heaven and a new earth. That's why Calvin made it his motto, his family motto, his personal motto. Cor meum tibi offero domine prompte et sincere. I offer you my heart promptly and sincerely. If the Reformation has humbled you to that extent, praise God. Live for His glory and not your own. You have your futures before you. Some of you have more future before you than others. And let God get all the glory of it in your decision-making, in your choices, as you weigh alternatives, as you pick life partners and vocations and fulfill dreams and ambitions and use the gifts that you have been given, that God would get all the glory Sally, Deo, Gloria, and especially because He has saved you. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to Thy cross I cling. Naked look to Thee for dress. Helpless look to Thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Father, we thank You for this time together. Thank You for the doctrines of the Reformation. Thank You for the courage and bravery of men like Luther and Melanchthon and others ready to lay down their lives. Think of those in the pre-Reformation like, like Huss who gave their lives, Tyndale and others who gave their lives in pursuance of the glory of God. And we pray today Grant us a vision of that glory. Humble us. Cause us to fall at your feet and to say, God alone gets all the glory and I get none. For Jesus' sake, amen.